Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the hot seat, third session. I'm so grateful to have a very special friend, a very special surgeon, very special human being. Howie Glockman is here with us today, and I'm pretty sure most of you know Howie, his magic, and his expertise. Uh, there is no doubt that he is absolutely one of the best in the world today. And um, I'm pretty sure after this presentation, you will notice his amazing skills and what he did for implant dentistry with all his efforts and new ideas and his approaches. Uh, Howie, as a very uh, traditional way, I want to have just a very quick CV of you. I'm sure that um, only your name is the best CV, but uh, very <laughs> shortly, uh, Howie Glockman uh, completed his dental training at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg in 1990s, and after spending a number of years in general practice, he completed a four-year full-time degree in oral medicine and periodontics at the University of Estelenbosch, I don't know if I pronounced it right, in Cape Town. He's a director, yeah, he's a director uh, at the Implant and Aesthetic Academy, and also he has a full-time private practice in Cape Town. He also recently had his PhD in partial extraction therapy, which will be his topic today. And I'm very happy that their recent article, which is a decade of the socket shield technique, will be reviewed in the hot seat today. And also, I have to say that I had this pleasure to publish a partial extraction therapy book in Persian, which is based on Howie Glockman's PhD. And also, we have a contribution of all the PET group guys. So, because Howie, you haven't received this uh, book yet, I just want to show you with the first page which is your introduction and our photo in your office in cape town and brilliant brilliant, brilliant. so all the contributors of the book the pet group people all of them are involved in the book with their amazing presentations and this book is available is for all the iranian and farsi language people and i'm sure the english version by howie himself going to be out soon and so many other things and I'm pretty sure how we will talk about it. How we are ready for your amazing presentation and we can have a discussion about all the things that we're going to talk about today. Thank you. Thanks for me. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, a, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. It's a uh, firstly, to be with you uh, as a as a dear friend, you know, um, I've been I've been to Iran, uh, um, visited you in your country, lectured in your country, and it was uh, one of the most uh, wonderful experiences I've ever had. And uh, your uh, your um, your um, hospitality was second to none. So it was really amazing. I loved every minute of it, and it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with you. Um, Farsi book. It's, it's just amazing that people are are reading and and uh, you know something as as difficult as uh, partial extraction therapy to try and get it uh, um, you know past the into acceptance of, of mainstream has been a, a, a tricky job and and it's something that myself and the whole research team from many countries around the world and there are too many to mention but just to just to give credit to the whole team that I work with you know I mean of uh, um, of, our, of our partial extraction therapy team and, and they know who they are around the world um, and obviously the, the guys uh, that who are who are closer are obviously Maurice Salama and Jonathan Detoy both of whom are my co-publishers and, and guys that I work with so closely so a special shout out to, to them for for all the effort and all the work that that's gone into the last um, six seven years of work that's uh, that's been done and then obviously um, one has to give credit. Firstly, I think to uh, Maurice Salama and Team Atlanta, Henry Salama, uh, David uh, Garber, uh, Ronald Goldstein, etc., because they really set off partial extraction therapy many, many years ago with their first publication on submerged root therapy. And that's really where the start of partial extraction therapy was. 
And uh, it's amazing that all these years later, you know, the Team Atlanta is still at the forefront of developing new things. And uh, I mean, uh, you look at the, uh, the, um, the scallop guide that's just come out. I mean, it's just, this is just unbelievable innovation. They just don't give up. And it's just a, it's a pleasure and an honor, firstly, to be friendly with them and secondly, to be working with them. It's been a, they've been a big, uh, a big um, role in my life. Um, and then obviously to Jonathan, my, uh, my co-writer and uh, really somebody that uh, is indispensable um, and such an important part of the team and, and all of the work that we do here, I could not do without, without him. Um, it's just not possible. So just a big thanks to all of those people. So Howie, the, the topic today uh, is, as you said, it's partial extraction therapy. The name that I think uh, was introduced by you and Maurice through Dental XP and all other pet groups just being involved. Nowadays, we all know according to the evidences available and what we can really see and feel it in practice that how predictable the aesthetic outcome going to be with this technique. But as you yourself, yourself knows that many people have some guards uh, in, in executing that technique. Some people usually say that with a negative way that we don't know what will happen next. What if this? What if that? And we all know that every technique needs skills, need expertise. We should be aware of all the possible complications, how to prevent them, how to treat them if, it ha if they happen, because it's something uh, that is usually happening in all techniques and not only in only one technique. So what's your idea or I can say like reaction or response to such uh, uh, things being said about this technique? Um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. You know, firstly, I, I never want to force anything down anybody's throat. I think everybody's entitled to their opinion and you know, there are a lot of detractors, there are a lot of naysayers, and there are a lot of negative people um, about the technique. And um, that's okay. You know, if you don't want to do it, don't do it. If it doesn't fit your profile, then, you know, don't do it. Um, certainly, I think we've passed tipping point. I think you see at most conferences now, someone's talking about socket shield. Um, there's partial extraction therapy, socket shield. Just to clarify something, maybe what the difference is between socket shield and partial extraction therapy, because a lot of people use the names, they intermix the names, it's that, and that's actually incorrect. Partial extraction therapy is a term it is an umbrella term that, uh, it's, a, it's a term that uh, Maurice Salama came up with on one of the Dental XP uh, threads that we, that we were on when we were talking about uh, the different protocols. And basically it encompasses three techniques. And those three techniques are submerged root therapy, socket shield, and pontic shield. So it's really, it's an umbrella group that, that houses all of those three techniques. Socket Shield itself, the technique that was developed by Marcus Hertzler, and it has to go to Marcus because, I mean, as he's just one of those brilliant minds that we have in, in dentistry, and all credit has to go to him for the development and, uh, and uh, you know, the foresight to actually take this to the next level. And anyway, so when I first, I first heard Marcus in 2010 when he came to South Africa and he lectured on it, and I wasn't also grabbed by it that that very that that quickly i i, I kind of I, I didn't jump in immediately it took me a few years to, to think about it okay marcus was he he certainly warned us you know this is not to be done so i took that seriously and but then i found that one of my colleagues was doing it and he was just getting phenomenal results he showed me some of the results and i was staggered so i thought okay well if you're doing it it's time for me to jump in and i jumped in around uh 2012 2013 and um you know, what happened was, is I just, I started getting success immediately. I started getting success and I started getting results that were mind blowing. They were not like good results. They were just like every single one was unbelievable. And, you know, what I said at the unit in the, in the lecture, the, at, at the UPenn lecture the other night is the two main things for me that are key are predictability, number one and reproducibility and those are 
key words that, that should come through everything that we do. Every bone grafting, um, uh, soft tissue grafting, everything that we have should be reproducible and predictable. So predictable meaning that I can get the results almost eight out of 10 times, I should be able to get a good result or a great result um, eight, nine times out of 10, not one or two or three times out of 10. And reproducibility also means that people who are taking on the technique should be able to, within the first few times, get success with that technique just as well and just as easily as I'm getting it. Because if I'm the kind of guy that, okay, it's great, so I've got good hands and I can do the work and I get great results, but nobody else can repeat what I'm doing, then the technique really is, in my opinion, not a great technique. Mm -hmm. And it's something, and, and, and this is where Socket Shield and Root Submergence really is something special because it's so biologically sound that it, it, just, it just works well. And often, despite the fact that pe people are not doing it 100% correctly, because we see on Facebook, I mean, social media highlights everything. People complain about social media being the new norm, but Really, you can't hide. If you post your case, boy, people absolutely lay into you if you've done something wrong. I mean, there's no, you know what I mean? It's one thing to write an article. You don't know, you, everyone can disagree with you, but no one can say anything. You know what I mean? But when you show something on Facebook, boy, you get told if you've done something wrong. So in essence, to the, to the, to the people who, who, who don't want to do it, don't. It doesn't bother me in the slightest. I'm not here to, I'm not here to force anybody to do anything. Um, I'm just here to show what, what, what I'm doing. And if you choose to try it, then here are the techniques. And, and this is the way we are trying to improve and make the technique more simple because it is a, it is a tricky technique. There's no doubt about it. And let's not, not, let's not beat about the bush. You know, the techniques are not easy. Um, the techniques uh, require the correct instrumentation. The techniques require um, the correct, Correct uh, training, um, and what's happened is slowly but surely the technique has changed, has modified um, from the from the way that um, uh, Marcus Hertzler put it out in the beginning. It's changed some somewhat, and um, I mean obviously, but we've changed it a little bit. Marcus is still in in his way, and, and that's also okay. You know, I mean, there's there's different ways, and and people can choose. Um, I think it's very important that people understand they have options to do whatever they want to do. And, um, but the thing is, is that most people that I speak to that have done some socket shield and they say, well, I've done maybe four or five cases. And my first question then was, if you've done four or five cases, how's it, how's it been for you? What's, what's your results? And I have never, ever had anybody turn around to me and say, God, I've had failure after failure. I've always had like, my God, I'm getting the best results I've ever achieved. And that's universal in every country that I go to. And, I, and luckily enough, I travel every month and lecture in a different country, I, I, obviously until the lockdown. But, you know, that's the thing that we get. You know, you have the odd person who's had a complication and we see the odd complication. And, and you said it so rightly so. I mean, what technique do you have that doesn't have complications? And more applications are there because the technique hasn't been done correctly. Uh, guidelines have not been followed, which is pretty much the same as any technique. If I go do a curry block or if I go do a, a, a mesh GBR and I don't follow the rules strictly or I don't have the, the right instrumentation, I don't release the flap properly, I don't get passive closure, I've got a thin morphotype and I, you know, I, mean, I try and stretch the rules, then I'm going to burn my fingers. And unfortunately, that's what happens. But luckily enough, I think Socket Shield is one of those things and Root Submergence and, and uh, Pontic Shield are, are, are those things which really, um, for me personally, I've never achieved results like I'm achieving now. And I'm, I'm now in my eighth year of, uh, of, of the technique. Uh, Root Submergence I've been doing uh, for almost uh, 12 years with great success. You know, since the first article came out, I started doing Root Submergence. So I've been doing that since around 2007, 2008, and I've got unbelievable cases that are still stable to this day. Um, Socket Shield, I'm in my seventh, eighth year. Pontic Shield in my in my uh, in my sixth year um, since we since we published that that technique. Um, but it's just it's just unbelievable. So 
again, you know, what do you say to those people? I say, give it a try. You know, do, do, do try it and see what happens. And if it doesn't work in your hands, then don't do it again. You know, and that, that's okay. Um, but I certainly don't want to force anyone to do anything that they don't want to do. But I think we are working on a prospective study now. Um, we've got one year data that's, uh, that we're going to start working on publishing um, probably in the, next, in, the, in the next few months. And then that, that prospective study we will do, we will follow up for 10 years and we will do one year, three year, five year and 10 year publications on that. Um, and so far um, on the, in that publication, we have 100% success of all, the, of all the implants. All the implants are successful. We haven't lost a single shield. We haven't, we've had one complication of an internal shield exposure and uh, which, was, which was managed and within a month the crown was placed and the, the shield was covered up. So um, it's kind of with the new technique that we've developed, I think we've almost eliminated, well certainly in my hands, we've eliminated the, the, the majority of the complications that we published in our, in our 128 uh, case socket shield uh, a retrospective look which was uh, which was uh, a four up to four year follow-up so we've managed to eliminate that now and I very seldom have complications anymore so um, I just think it's a brilliant technique I just exactly. I, ca I can't recommend it more highly and and how we, we have usually uh, when we want to extract the tooth with all the evaluations that we're gonna have we usually have three options first we can uh, extract the tooth and let it heal and come back like a delayed approach or early approach and place our implants. The other one is going with the immediate implantation at the same time doing the gap management to put a provisional and etc. And the third one gonna be going with the partial extraction therapy, socket shield and place our implant and make sure to be able to maximizing the saving of the buccal plate and the contour. So this is usually maybe the questions for uh, many people that how they can decide to go uh, for what technique or which technique. Or for example, can we say that partial extraction therapy works perfect and it should be our first choice? Um, again, I don't want to pontificate. So I think I think. All, all techniques, you know, your, you can do your socket preservation with a delayed approach. You can do, uh, you can do uh, contour augmentation uh, the, the way Boo, Danny Boozer does it. You can do dual zone therapy uh, the way Dennis Tarnow and Stephen Chu do it. You can do, um, you can do the, um, the, um, the Agonini brothers technique of the surgical veneer graft uh, and things like that, which is contour, which is the, um, the dual zone therapy with connective tissue graft, uh, etc., or you can do socket shield. In my hands, uh, partial extraction therapy is always my first choice, as long as the parameters are there. And uh, obviously, you know, the parameters are set in our publications. We've set the, the parameters, the indications, and the contraindications for those. So, as long as you are following those guidelines, then Pocket shield would be my first choice. It shows that we're going to get collapse if we take the tooth out. It's 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 un, it's in unequivocal. It's uh, you know what I mean. There's there's too much data from too many groups. It's not one group saying there's collapse. There's there, there's so many. There's Botticelli. There's Ferris. There's Evans. There's uh, there's Cavani. There's um, uh, uh, Cadrapoli. There's Botticelli. I mean, there, there's just so many different groups around the world that have shown post-extraction implant, post-extraction, the socket collapses. Um, whether we can get bone and, and whether we can get um, soft tissue, your soft tissue is going to collapse one way or another. Whether you have bone or not is dependent on many, many factors, as we explained in our lecture the other night, your, your 3D positioning of your implant, what is your bucket palate of dimension, can you put your implant as far away from the, from the, from the, uh, the, the, the wall as possible so that you've got enough space for bone to grow around it? Or is your, is your bucket dimension so narrow that even a narrow diameter implant is right up against the, the wall, then you're not going to get, you know, the chances that you're going to get uh, bone around there are pretty poor. So 
in my hands, and again, I reiterate, in my hands, my first choice is partial extraction therapy. I try not to take out teeth anymore. It is my, my go-to technique, and it is my most successful technique that I have had in my hands, having done dual zone therapy for many years, having done uh, um, the, um, the, um, the Agonini Brothers technique, having done all the other techniques, this is the technique that works for me. And I think patients also appreciate it. I think that's the key factor because the key is, is that it is the least, um, it is the least um, invasive technique of anything. And that's why, that's why I go for that one first. Okay. I think now for, for all the audience to get the concept a bit better, let's talk about the steps in the technique and, um, or, or, how do you want to approach when do you want to do this technique? Well, I think what I want to share with you today is I want to share with you the, 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 the newest publication that will come out in the International Journal of Aesthetic Dentistry next, uh, either this month or next month. Um, and really what, what we've done is we changed the technique very early from the way uh, Marcus Herzler and Otto Zur published it in the beginning. Um, because of the fact that we had two problems. Firstly, their technique used implant drills to drill down the, drill down the implant and then to slowly reset the root and take it out. And there were two problems that, that I found very early on with that technique. Number one, um, the cost of implant drills is very, very high. And the minute I drilled into a tooth, I would virtually blunt the drill completely so the cost in certainly i live in a third world country you know you you're also in a country where economic times are hard and for me to replace uh, those drills every time is not possible the second issue is that when you're going straight down the canal when you have a route that's sitting uh, more uh, buckly inclined um, in a class one in a class two or class three inclination um, when you look at the radio plane position, if you do go through the apex, sometimes you actually perforate through the 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 the, the buckle the buckle the buckle tissue. Now, um, the one thing that obviously one can do these days is do guided surgery so that you absolutely perfect and things like that. But there's still the cost of the drills, a and b. Not everyone has guided surgery. And in fact, the majority of people around the world don't have guided surgery. So at this point in time, that's still a luxury. Mm -hmm. So we, we, the third thing that I found that was a problem is that when I started um, widening the, the hole that we had made, the osteotomy that we made in the implant, so we went from a two mil to a three mil to et cetera, wider and wider. What happened was is that the chatter that we developed, the chatter that was going on, um, the vibration of the drill on one or two occasions, number one, cracked the buckle portion of the shield, which then made it obsolete and I had to extract the tooth. And in other cases, it actually uh, mobilized the, uh, the, sh the, the, the root and I had to then abort the, the, the technique and go for more routine uh, technique. So from that point of view, we then moved along to you and pieces with root resection drills. We still had how do we hit the apex properly because that's really the biggest problem because with root resection drills, you can go off angle very easily and end up going palatal, end up going buckle. You know, it really, it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing to, to be able to work out. So from that point of view, the biggest issue that we had was going straight. How do we go straight? And I think that's where most people... And certainly people that I uh, discussed the technique with or, or who asked about how to do it, they would say, well, I keep missing the apex or you see cases where the, the apex has been left behind, gutter perk has been left behind, both of which, in my opinion, are contraindications, you know what I mean? Because those things are possible niduses of infection. They might have bacteria in them. You want to eliminate them. So we... we developed this technique and and this is a technique that i slowly worked on and with the questions that were being answered i believe that what's happened here is that we've slowly developed a technique that makes it more user-friendly put it that way and makes it more reproducible and 
takes away one of the most difficult issues of how do I hit the apex perfectly. Now, there's no doubt if you can use guided surgery, there are certain guided surgery techniques, and some, has, some have already been published. Um, I'm working on stuff with, uh, with the Versa group where we are doing uh, uh, guided, guided surgery using the Versa drills, and they are developing special drills for, uh, for socket shield and for partial extraction therapy so that we can reuse them. They're much, uh, more, they're much stronger drills. There's less chatter, etc. So we can use those with guided techniques as well. And then there's also the navigated surgery, the dynamic navigation, which, which I'm doing with Navident at the moment. And uh, I know Joey Chen uh, in, uh, in Taiwan and China is also doing, is also doing a lot of work with the, with the Navident. He's part, of, he's part of our group. So that's another option. But as I said, you know, the Navident and the, and the guided surgeries, these are expensive options and they are not something that everybody can have. So what we've done is we've developed this technique and uh, this technique, I believe, gives us that ability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through the technique slowly but surely. And just to give you an understanding, the upper right, uh, the upper right central incisor in this patient has got, uh, he hit this tooth uh, many, many years ago. The, the lateral at this point in time you can see is an implant which he knocked out. So he, he avulsed the, uh, the total avulsion of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the one, two or the seven and uh, then partial, av partial uh, avulsion of the, of the eight or the, or the one, one. And the one, one now has ex uh, external root resorption and needs to be extracted. So the external root resorption number one is not a contraindication to socket shield and in fact, um, it works very, very well in that because often when we have a patient who uh, who has resorption, what happens with resorption, it usually gets replaced by bone. So even if the even if the socket shield does resorb over time, it's going to be replaced by bone. And I'm sure many of you have seen uh, root resorption cases where all you can see is the is the cone of the GP and the root's completely gone. And yet, if you look at the case from the outside, the bow, the contour is absolutely perfect. There's no collapse of the contour in a lot of the cases. So that's why we do it in these cases. So what we do in these cases is the first thing we do, you can see the contour and you can see, you can see over here, it's, it's very interesting because you can see how beautiful the contour is over here and you can see how we've got collapse. Even though we've got nice bone on the lateral, you can see what's happened. You can see what's happened with that. Um, oh, sorry, I just pushed uh, the wrong thing there. And if we have a look at the side there, sorry about the blood, you can see um, on the side here, you can, see, you can see the collapsed area over there. And you can see this is also a thin gingival morphotype. And we know that thin gingival morphotypes are completely contraindicated for immediate implants because those are the ones that uh, Evans, uh, Evans and Ferris, both of them, Evans and Chen and Ferris's article, they both were categoric about the fact that when you, um, when you, um, when you do um, when you do have a situation where um, you've got thin morphotypes, your collapse is going to be your buccopalatal collapse is going to be that much more. So from that point of view, it is a it is a it is a difficult thing to do. So if we have a look at the CBCT, okay, what we're doing is we we have the ability with our CBCT to number one navigate. To see, and if we just go to this one, I used this the other night. You can see here how we utilize our CBCT. Yeah. Now, most importantly, what we do is we retract the lips. We put either cotton wool rolls or a retractor so that you can actually see. And if you see this area, you can actually see the soft tissue very beautifully, okay, in that area. And the reason you can see the soft tissue is because the lips have been retracted from the uh, C from the CBCT and allow you to to have a look to see what's going on. So what happens is if we, if we do that, then you can actually see the soft tissue because this is critical. Because the soft tissue, the buccal gingiva is going to be your, your guide. You are going to do all your measurements from that gingival margin, okay? So it's imperative that you are able to do that with this technique and using a CBCT. So CBCT is not negotiable. And you can have a look, if you have a look here as well, just another thing, if you have a look here, if I perforate, if I go too far with my drill and I hit through there, 
I'm going to make a hole in that area over there. So it's imperative that I work to the apex and I'm absolutely clear about my positioning. And that's why this technique is so critical. So once I've identified the gingiva, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to measure the gingival margin to the crest of the bone. And why is that so important? Because what this is going to do, this is now going to allow me, okay, it's going to allow me to know how far I must put my shield because from our work, we have found that we want to put the shield at bone level, which we have published already, okay? Marcus Hertzler believes it should be one millimeter uh, super, uh, uh, above the bone. We put it to bone level, and the reason we put it to bone level is because of the fact that the biggest complication we have is internal exposure. And the minute you leave it a little bit high, you tend to get far more internal exposures than if you put it to bone level. Okay, so we put it to bone level. So it's important that I'm able to do this measurement because now there's no bone sounding, there's no guessing, there's no thing for me to say, okay, it's this or it's that. I know it's three millimeters below the gum, four millimeters or whatever it is. If it's six, seven millimeters, then you've got to know socket shield is not your technique. You have a dehiscence. If you have a dehiscence, you have to do delayed approach. Or, in, or immediate dental alveolar reconstruction, a la Carlos de Rosa, but you can't do socket shield. Okay, so here you can see the first thing I can see, number one, my buccal bone is intact. Number two, I can visualize the soft tissue. Number three, I can measure gingival level to bone level. I can then also measure from, ginger, from gingival level, I can measure the level from gingiva to the apex. And again, this is absolutely critical because this is going to mean the prevention of me going through the apex and perforating the buccal plate. Okay. And the third thing that it allows me to do is it allows me to plan the possible uh, shape of the shield. And I'm looking to have around two thirds of the shield. I don't want a short shield because if you have a short shield and you don't get ankylosis of that shield, it can over erupt. You want a long shield that you're going to make sure that it gets ankylosed around that thing, and that way you're going to not have the problem. But the key is I have to remove the apex, and I have to remove all the gutta perca. So let's have a look now from there at what we do. And then we're going to place the implant as far palatal as possible. Can it touch the shield? It can, but very, very lightly, because if you touch the shield with an aggressive thread, the potential that you either dislodge the thread, the, the, the shield, you crack the shield, you mobilize the shield is there. But Herzler's um, initial and, uh, and Daniel Baumer's initial histology on animals both showed the shield in contact with the implant and both showed good bone growth. So it does, it's not a problem if you touch it, but it's better if you don't, okay? It's not only better if you don't touch it because of cracking the shield and moving the shield, but it also allows more space and prevents the internal exposure. So the further you are away, the more space you have for soft and bone to grow in. And that's just something that I found over the years in which we've published on. So here you can see it also allows you on the right hand side, it allows you to just and make sure that the bone and know that everything is there. So the first thing that we do is once we've got everything intact, we cut off the, the crown to gum level, trying not to damage the gum in any way. So we, we go down to gum level, and the reason we do this is we want to make sure that we have the gingival level to work with. So we're cutting it at gingival level, okay? And there you can see I've now got the gutta perca intact, if I have a post, either a metal post or a, a fiber post, it is very simple to remove this. It is not a contraindication to a socket shield. It is something that is very simple, but the way you take it out is very important. And when we take it out, we are going to, we are going to drill only on the palatal side of it until such time as we have got that loose with a sharp uh, root resection drill. Okay, now you can either get the root resection drills from Comet. There are many, you can use a diamond drill if you want, but you want very long drills. 
We have also brought out a kit, a uh, partial extraction therapy kit with, uh, with uh, Megagen. Um, and I think this further helps you to have the right tools to allow you to, to allow you to do this. And it's got these special root resection drills in there. And for anyone who's interested in that, certainly get hold of your Megagen reps. They'll be able to, to help you with our partial extraction therapy kits, which has all the drills necessary. So once you actually create the space around this area here, what it does is it loosens the post and you can take the post out. But making sure the fact that you've only gone palatal means that you have not done any damage to the shield on the buckle portion. Okay. And that's the key. And once that's done and you've got it out, you pretty much go back to the same, to the same technique that you had before. Once we've got that now, we've removed the post and we've got access to our gutter perker. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to use normal Gates Glidden burrs. Why Gates Glidden? Quite simple, because they are non-end cutting. They only cut, they are side cutting instruments. They cannot cut, so they cannot damage the apical portion. And that's the key. So what we do is we then use an endo block. We have endo stoppers. We put them on. We get our measurement from our CVCT. We go down to the level using our, our buckle gingiva as our landmark. And once we've got to that level, we take an x-ray, again, checking to see that I'm at the apex and trying to get down. Now, if you have a look here, you can see categorically that I'm just a little bit short in this area. So I'm going to just increase it a little bit more and just go a little bit past that. I mean, if there's anything that you want to ask, just stop me in the middle and just if there's any questions you want to clarify, please just stop me and ask. It's, let's have this as a discussion. That would be awesome if there's anything that's, that's not clear. Okay. So now that I can see I'm maybe a millimeter short, I'm going to go back to my endo block. I'm going to make it a millimeter longer, take another x-ray, confirm that I'm at the apex. And once I'm at the apex, now I can start enlarging with a, a number two Gates Glidden, a number three, and I usually go up to about a number five Gates Glidden. And what that does is that makes the entire canal patent and it opens up the canal. So I know exactly when I put my fast drill down to the tip, my fast drill is at the apex. I cannot go further than that point. And that's the key to making sure. And also when I use my drill, my drill's not going off axis because I've now got a, a, a straight hole that guides me to the absolute correct tip of the root. Does that make sense? So Howie, just okay. before you continue, one question, because um, I think it's a very important point to you, Gates Gleden. Is it possible for people to do it with uh, with uh, like turbine burrs? Do you recommend it? With which burrs? With with uh, with the diamond burrs, with, with the high speed diamond. Yes, burrs. but but the diamond burrs are only coming later. You can do those later, but they are not to be used at this point in time. If you use a fast handpiece and a fast drill, a diamond or a root resection drill at this point, okay. Mm -hmm. If you use those at this point, the chance of you going off axis is very, very high. It's difficult to get that angulation right. And this is why you have to use, and you'll notice this is a one-to-one -one handpiece. It's a blue ring, one-to-one -one handpiece, a blue ring, surgical handpiece using the gates. So quite to cut off the root. Then you're changing to a slow handpiece, a blue ring one-to-one -one handpiece. And that's important because it's much better. You need to use these at around 5,000 RPM. Otherwise, it goes too slow. If you're using a routine 20-to-1 handpiece, the reduction handpiece that we use for, for implants, it makes it very, very difficult to, to actually drill. Okay, so, so it's main, not ideal. So the main step was to... First, evaluate on CVCT the, the, to measure the gingival margin to the apex, and then start with the gates gliding to remove if there is any gutta percha or not to go exactly to the apex, right? Correct. So even if, if there's endomaterial or no endomaterial, you're going to use the gates gliding to get down your canal. Yeah. Obviously, sometimes it's sclerosed and you can't, you have no choice. But this is the way in the majority of the cases we want to work. If, if it's sclerosed, you have no choice to go first 
to a fast handpiece. Yeah, but yeah. in the majority of the case, the Gates Glidden works well. And this will now allow you to open up the canal before you get to the fast hand pieces. Mm -hmm. Okay, is that clear? Clear, crystal. Okay, good. Okay, so now you can see we've opened up that canal. So now I'm now almost ready to go for my fast drills. Okay, so here you can see I've now got the fast drill. Now we start with the fast drill. And you can see that I've marked on the slide, you can see the little marking pen that I've used, okay? In the new, in the new kits from Megagen, we've actually got markings on the drill, so you don't have to make the markings with a pen. But if you're using the Comet drills, then you can just make a little mark. I use, again, the endo block with a little, a little, a little sterile uh, pen that I, I just put the mark on. And that mark now is also going to go to the apex, okay? And then when I go to the apex, I take an x-ray again because I want to make sure. So it's, a, it's, a, it's slow, it's general. There's no, we are not in a rush. Yeah. We want to be as careful and as gentle as possible. This, this is not a race. This is, not a, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And I think that's the key is be gentle, be careful, be slow, develop your techniques and you'll get it right. So what we do is we now put this down to the apex and now from the apex, we start kind of creating that curvature and we're cutting now from mesial to distal from the apex upwards. Sorry, I just want to go back to, I just want to go back to that slide because here you can actually see, for those of you who are a little worried that we're extracting a good tooth, here you can see the, in this area there, you can see the external resorption on the periapical very, very well, okay, which was on the palatal side. Yeah. Okay. So now what we've done is we've now sectioned the root, okay? But I've sectioned the root from the apex to the coronal portion, making sure that I go smaller, smaller, and, and my, my arc gets wider and wider as I get more coronal because the root, remember, is a taper, okay? And I'm making sure that I'm cutting through. If I hit the bone a little bit on either side, is it gonna make a difference? The answer is no. If there's a tooth close by, you have to be very, very careful that you don't, that you don't perforate that area and get, get, into, into, get into that area. Okay, so from, that, so from that point of view, it's very, very important. Um, the next thing is once I've sectioned it, you'll notice also that because I've, got the, because I've got the implant next door, I've kind of extended my shield a little bit interproximally um, it's not really necessary because even, even from line angle to line angle tends to maintain the, uh, the papilla. But I've gone a little bit more because there was a, there was a, a slight uh, bone loss on the, on the implant next door. So I wanted to make sure that I really maintained the interproximal bone as, as, as well as I could. So we kind of just expanded it. And, and I think some guys call it a T-belt or et cetera. Some other people have spoken about it. Joseph Kahn certainly was the first one to publish the, the interproximal shields to maintain, the, to maintain that. It'll be interesting to see uh, from, from uh, Joseph Kahn where he's got with that and what's happening with that. So the next thing that we've done is we've taken out the palatal root. Now, the key factor here is that when we are trying to remove this, it is very important not to put your elevator anywhere into that area. Your elevator only goes around the back this area here. Mm -hmm. And you can use a period. I use these days an electronic mallet, which is a, a brilliant thing. It's, it has a little, uh, a little root, a root, root, a root, uh, a little uh, osteotome portion that goes in and taps it once and literally that, that piece comes out. It's so easy to remove it. But what you must do in the beginning is make sure that you put your finger on the buckle of that shield when you are elevating. Because what that does is it allows you to understand whether the shield is actually going to, is able to be removed or not. If, there's, if you feel that as you're elevating the palatal portion and the buckle shield is moving, you know that you haven't separated the shield, the, the two parts properly. Go back, use good lighting, use good suction, evaluate, see where it's still cut, cut it, then take it out. So here we've taken out the palatal portion, okay? Now that we've got the palatal portion, now we have to now go to the root and now we have to start developing the shield. 
And in the article, we've broken it up into different parts. The first part is actually removing the apical portion. We're going to now deal with the apical portion because sometimes you leave the whole apex and sometimes you leave the, uh, you leave the, um, you leave some of the, 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 the gutta perca and the apical portion behind. So what we do now is we use, this is a two millimeter diamond drill, okay, on a straight hand piece. You can use a contra angle if you want, but it has to be a long diamond. And I find this works very, very well. It's a surgical um, straight hand piece. And the reason why it's nice is because now you're using a hand piece that can get to the apex with ease. Because with a long shanked, with one of these, um, these, uh, these diamond drills on a, on a straight hand piece, you can get even to the apex of a long canine. And that's important. You've got to get access. And sometimes you have teeth on either side where your contra angle doesn't get down. It stops you from getting to the apex. So this really works well, number one. And number two, you don't want to use any fast hand pieces. You don't want to use any turbines at the apex where there's a risk that you perforate the buckle plate. So the slow hand piece is absolutely key to now going in. And, and there's a very crucial way that you use this because you don't go in and push apically. You're going to go in and you're going to paint coronally. So now you're going in, you're going into the root. So if I can draw, if I can just draw the root here, okay, and we'll just draw the shield with a little bit of the apex left behind. I'm now putting this drill into here. Sorry, my Picasso drawings are not brilliant, but, and this now drill is now going to slowly take away that portion. Can you see that? Yeah. But you take away that portion by painting coronally and gently. Slowly, slowly, slowly removing all this portion away until you end up with that two-thirds root remaining on the buckle. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and, the, and the point is that in, uh, in your partial extraction therapy kit, all these drills have markers. So, so it's easy Correct. for the practitioner to evaluate exactly where is he going and what is he doing. Yeah, my kit does not have this drill. Okay, it doesn't have this drill. It has a different drill I call the Richard Martin drill. Yeah. Okay, we all know Richard Martin is a, is a, brilliant, uh, a brilliant maxillofacial surgeon from, uh, from Dallas and also part of our research team. And it's a different drill which has the markings which allows you to do the same thing as this. But this is, I wanted to show this in the, in the, in the technique because a lot of people don't have that kit. And you want to be able to use things that are generic to your practice, things that you have uh, which is important so that everybody has the opportunity. It's not that you have to buy the kit. You don't have to. Do I want you to? Of course I want you to. But do you have to? The answer is no. You don't have to. And that's why we've, that's why we've done it that way. So once we've done this, we've now used this to now, we've now managed the apical portion of the shield. And we've now removed the gutta perca. We've removed the apex. And now we take an x-ray again. Because now I want to know, I want to confirm that everything's gone. Okay, and there you can see, we can check, we can see that the gutta perk is gone. We can see that we've eliminated the majority of the shield. And you can see here why it's so important. If you have a look, you can see potential to be a problem because that bone, if I take out this tooth in toto, that, that thing is going to collapse to that bone level. That, this is going to disappear all the way to that level over there. And that's what I don't want because that's going to cause an aesthetic disaster when I'm dealing with two implants next to each other. So you can see here on the left-hand side, you can see how we are utilizing it with water flow, working through the apex, slowly painting downwards. And I use this at around 5,000 RPM again. And that way, it gives us a lot of tactile function. It gives us a lot of uh, ability to slowly do it. Once I've eliminated the apex, I can now go and deal with the coronal portion. I now need to develop the coronal portion of the shield. And these are gingival retractors. Uh, these ones are nice because they are titanium. 
I don't like the metal retractors because the other metal retractors are stainless steel and you can see sometimes we hit the shield and I don't want stainless steel metal shards going into my area. If I hit it, the best thing I want is titanium. If, and the reason we can't use ceramic is that we can't bend them. The nice thing about the titanium is it's soft and I can use an orthodontic pliers to kind of mold it so that it goes around the, uh, the, the different shapes of tooth uh, that I used. Uh, this uh, shield, uh, this uh, gingival retractor, which is a key part of the technique to retract the gingiva. You have to retract and protect the gingiva. Otherwise, you will drill the gingiva and you will cause recession. So it's very, very important. You cause external exposures that way. So the gingival retraction is important. And these uh, retractors are made by Ustamed in Germany. And if anybody wants uh, any of the information, they can, uh, they can uh, Facebook me um, uh, WhatsApp me, they can send me a message and I'll be happy to, to share the, uh, to, to share the, the dealers who, who, who do these things. Now, the drill that I'm using here, which is in our pet kit, and this is just the normal, it's a green diamond, three millimeters in diameter. Okay. Now, I know that my bone is three millimeters below the, below the gum. So, all I'm going to do now is I'm going to just create a notch, exactly the same way as you would do if you are if you are um, creating a if you are creating a um, a depth guide for your veneers, so you create the notch so that you've got that margin. You know where your three millimeter margin is, and now I can now go and just continue left, continue right to remove this portion and this portion. Okay, but there's one very important factor that you have to remember is that you have to remember that this curves upwards. The bone curves; it is not flat. So you don't want to cut three millimeters flat. You want to cut it in an arc. You want to create the arc like that, okay, in the shield, the same way so that that would follow the bone from mesial to distal, and that is absolutely key. All right, if you flatten it, you are going to drill away the interproximal bone. You don't want to do that, okay? It's very important. Once we've done that, the next thing that we're going to do is we are going to create with the same drill, okay? We, with the same round drill, we are going to create the chamfer. So what we've done here is in the shield, if I just draw, I'm just going to go back, let's make a white. If I draw this and we create the shield, so the shield is now at bone level. Now what I'm going to do is I'm now going to create a two millimeter chamfer. Okay, the original article called for a, for a bevel. Now the problem with a bevel is it doesn't give you enough space. Okay, you want a chamfer. So you want, the chamfer should be two millimeters. Okay, that's very, very important. And that two millimeters then allows you the space. This is now called the prosthetic space. Okay, in our partial extraction therapy kit, we have special instruments that allow you to flatten the bone and to create the chamfer. It makes it much more simple and much more easy. So it's something uh, that if you, if it's something that you, that you want to get into, that may be something that you can look at is getting that kit. So that chamfer, if we have a look here, this is something now that we call the prosthetic space. And this is something that Maurice, uh, Jonathan and myself published uh, in the Journal of Prosthetic Dentistry. And the whole concept of this prosthetic space was to prevent internal exposures. Okay. And that is absolutely key. And the diagram is not perfect because this thing should be just a little bit higher. It should be about 0 0,5 millimeters above that, that end of the chamfer. Okay. The shield should just be a little bit lower than the shield, than the, the, so that you've got the maximum amount of space between your prosthetics and your shield. And that will allow your shield to be covered by soft tissue very, very easily. Okay, so the prosthetic space is absolutely essential. Okay, in this case, uh, we, uh, we used a, a Strauman BLX. We did guided surgery uh, using the R2Gate system. Uh, we placed the implant. This is placing the implant in the normal three-dimensional positioning. We, we follow uh, Caneva, Cavani, all the um, Evans, uh, Ferris, all the, the same routine. Place it palatal, place it a little bit deeper, Use the narrowest diameter implant that's possible with the implant system that you're using. 
I like to use an implant that's got a good thread design that uh, it's going to give me good primary stability so that I'm able to place it. So um, there are lots of different options. There's the Megagen implant, which is one I use uh, extensively. There's also the new implant from, uh, from Stephen Chu and Southern Implants, the Inverter, which, is, which has a very fat base and strong apical threads with a very narrow base, which means that you can you increase, you, it's called a body shift, so you're actually creating less space or more space between the, the shield and the buckle space, and it's designed for their dual zone therapy, which is also something cool. And as I said, the Megagen is, uh, is, the, is the one I use um, uh, a lot, which works very, very well. Um, obviously, getting excellent insertion torque is key because that now allows me to provisionalize my case. If I cannot provisionalize my case, I have to do a custom abutment, as I mentioned in the, in the lecture at UPenn the other night. Custom, custom abutments are absolutely key if you don't have primary stability. But we had very good primary stability with the, with the BLX, so we were able to do that. Placing our implant away from the shield, placing our implant 0.5 millimeters above, so you can see from the, from the, from the animation that we've got there, the, the, you can see where, you can see where the, the, the level of the, the, level of, the uh, of the shield is to the bone. You can see the chamfer, that's two millimeters from the, from the bone level. And you can see now that this portion is just above, just 0.5 millimeters above that, the base of the chamfer to create the prosthetic space. Okay, and that certainly in all our prospective data now has shown that we can almost eliminate that completely. Fabrication of the temporary, there are many different ways and I'll just show you my way for, for interest sake. So here we take a, a temporary abutment. I, I prefer titanium. I don't like the peak abutments because um, the, I find it's very difficult for the composite to bond to it. We're going to use the patient's own tooth and we're going to retrofit the patient's own tooth. So here we put it in, we cut it down using a, 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 a tungsten a carbide, carb, uh, I can't remember what these are called, but these, these, uh, these are Joe Dandy drills. We cut them down, we create uh, an abutment on, the, on, the, uh, on, on there. And then from there on out, we, we then put it back on. Um, I drill out the tooth, um, <clears throat> completely open up the tooth, make it, keep only the buckle facing. Um, we've, before we started, we took an index, and I find this index works very, very well for me. I create this little V-notch over here just so that when I, when I cure with my curing light, there's space for the curing light to work. And we put it, we fit it in, and then what we do is create a hole in the top, and the hole in the top allows us then to maintain patency of our screw hole because we want to do screw retained crowns we never ever want to do cement retained crowns especially at the provisional phase mm -hmm. um, if it's a little bit off center then i'll come out buckle i will always i'll fill it with composite but i never ever do cement retained provisionals ever and if i can just be uh, if i can just repeat that i never do cement retained provisionals <laughs> okay ever okay so what we do now is we we put that in we obviously we put rubber dam, uh, we use rubber dam material just to cover up so no composite can flow into our socket. We etch, we bond uh, the tooth. Okay, normally if I'm using, if it's a ceramic crown, I'll acid etch it with uh, porcelain etch, silane bond. If it's zirconia, we do the normal zirconia bond uh, that's prescribed by Marcus Blatz in, in, his, in his protocol for zirconium bonding. Um, we then put a toothpick. Um, and the toothpick, we have to put Vaseline on the toothpick or it's imperative because if you don't put Vaseline on that toothpick, you're not getting the toothpick out and you will then embarrass yourself by trying to drill the crown off, which is not so cool. So make sure you put Vaseline composite into the crown. We put flowable composite around the base of this as well. We then fill the whole thing up and we fit it into that area, putting it into position. Okay. Now what we do is we light cure from the side. We light cure from this position first. We then pull out the, the, the toothpick. We light cure from the top and we give it a good cure. We take off the, um, we take off the, uh, the, the, um, the uh, pink, uh, pink stuff, <laughs> okay? And then we cure again and making sure that everything's, uh, everything's held together very, very well. And only once we're happy that it's cured, 
do we then unscrew the crown with the, with the abutment. And once we unscrew the crown, this is now what we dealt with. We now have to create the submergence profile or the subcritical contour, as, uh, as uh, Sue uh, mentioned is he, in his article, which is such a brilliant article. And uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to now add flowable composite to the base. And once we've added flowable and we've shaped it, we put the crown back in. Okay. And you can see how well it takes to the contour. And you can see now we've drawn a line. Can you see this little pencil line that we've drawn there? Okay. And uh, I'm just going to go back. And you can see, so just to say we draw a pencil line over there. Now, the purpose of the pencil line is to mark where the gingiva sits. Because we know from Sue that we want our emergence profile to only start one millimeter below the gum. And that is absolutely crucial. Because if it starts one millimeter below the gum, that is going to give you your stability of soft tissue. And then what it enables us to do, it enables us to now cut away the remainder of, the, of that structure, which is possibly going to impinge on our shield. It also allows more soft tissue thickening. As Thomas Lenkovicius's work tells us, we want thick tissue. So if I make, if I over contour, I'm going to push the tissue up. I'm going to thin out the soft tissue. So I want to thin this, thin this out as much as possible. And I'm going to start thinning it from one millimeter from that position. So here, I'm just going to go back there. Sorry, let me go back here. So from there, what I can now do is I can now do that. And I can now contour and take away, and this is in three dimensions, so it's also happening on this portion as well. Okay, so we then polish it up very, very well. In this case, I used uh, three, first pumice, then I used three different diamond pastes up to, uh, up to uh, I think it's a 0 .3, 0 0.3 micron diamond paste. We highly polish it. I know this is very different to what uh, Dennis Tarnow and Stephen Chu uh, believe. Um, with regards to they want it as rough as possible because they leave the, the rougher it is, the more hemidesmosomal attachment you want. But I prefer, and it's just my, it's just my opinion, it's, it's just a little different. It's, it's not right or wrong. When I take my thing off, I want a beautifully healthy soft tissue. That's what I want to see. Um, and I've got the socket shield that's going to prevent the collapse. So here you can see with the different pastes, just polishing everything up. And here you can see now with the final contour that we've achieved, um, we now have the final correct contour that's now going to sit very, very passively and is going to now take on. I add a little bit of PRF just to kind of seal the area there as well. Completely uh, anecdotal. There's no scientific evidence to show that this does anything better. Uh, it's just a feel good thing and you can do it or not do it if you want to. And then in goes the provisional crown. And I call it a walkout as you walk in because the patient looks no different. And, and I think it has something from a mental point of view. It plays also when the patient looks in the mirror and they look the same. It almost makes the technique seem a lot better because they haven't had anything done. Um, so the key factor now is if we look at the soft tissue and now we waited around nine months for everything to finish and for everything to, to go ahead. And here you can see what it looks like at nine months when we now go to the, it's now going to the final, the final result. And most importantly is look at what the papilla looks like between the two implants. Look at the soft tissue, look how thin that soft tissue is and look how it has not moved. If we look at it from the top, you can see the two implants next to each other and you can still see there is no collapse. If we look at Vivian Chapuis' work, if we look at Myron Nevin's you have lost buckle plate, that there's absolutely no breakdown of the buckle plate whatsoever. Most importantly is if we look at the periapicals, and this is where it's absolutely mind-blowing, because firstly, if you look at day of placement, and you look nine months post-op, firstly, the green arrow shows you the bone infill, which is the most critical thing because you can see there's no, it doesn't look like there's bone on the left and you can see clear bone fill on the right. Okay. Which is absolutely critical. And that's something that's key. But most importantly is look at this, look at that position. 
look at the bone and compare the bone left to right and you can see that the papilla has been maintained because of the fact that we've stabilized that interproximal bone. And we are busy with a publication now, uh, Jonathan, Maurice and myself, on uh, adjacent implants and, and specifically um, central laterals and, and our whole group, uh, our whole research group uh, is involved in this because they are they're all providing cases. So it's going to be a big group of, of, uh, of multi-center cases coming through to us from our whole research group from Chuck Schrimmer, Shazana Paul, Jorge Campos, uh, Matilla Bodrogi, uh, the, the whole group, everybody, everybody's uh, Huck on Kate, uh, Joe Chen, I can mention, I can mention everybody, the, they, they're all there. Um, Richard Martin, um, Marcelo uh, Ferro from, uh, from Chile. So all of them will be involved in this. Um, and it's really the results are, this is really where, this is just the most staggeringly exciting thing. I can't, it just blows my mind. And I, and I, I already have five year data on some of my cases and it's still stable to this day. And, and that, that blows my mind. And that's where I think when, when, when the people come and they say, oh, well, Socket Shield's not for me. When I look at cases like these and it's just, unbelievable and here you can see from a cdct point of view you can see what everything looks like you can see how beautiful everything is we've still maintained our bone you can see over here how the buckle bone's been maintained in that position and really just a technique in my opinion that is it's just the next level technique and it's just uh, the socket shield brilliant again kudos to marcus hersela thank you so much and uh, i hope um the explanation of this technique is, uh, is, is enough to kind of, to help people to maybe take that jump and to take the leap and to actually try out this technique for themselves and see, what it, see how it works for them. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. I hope I've explained it well. Very, very beautifully demonstrated. How you, uh, one of the questions that I have is uh, about the shape of the shield. As you said, we, we need a C-shape from line angle to line angle, but in such cases that there is a risk for bone resorption or due to the problem in the adjacent tooth or implant, we can do it uh, more like a semicircular instead of only line angle to yeah. line angle. And I noticed in Correct. Case, yeah. If you, yeah, if you go back one slide to the pre-apical evaluation that you showed beautifully, yeah, uh, you showed the interproximal bone being saved. I think it was a slide before the end. Yes. Yeah, here. Uh, in this, with this red arrow that you're showing, yeah, exactly. This is, the, this is the part of the shield in the interproximal that has been saved, okay? So I want to know right. when, we are, when we are saving the proximal part of the shield, should the level of the reduction be the same as the buckle or it should go as like following the CEJ contour, going up in the proximal and a little bit downer in the, in the buckle? I think you made, you made such a critical point there and, and, and I, I did mention it uh, when I was talking, is that it's absolutely crucial that when you make the shield, the shield follows the bone contour in the same way that it would uh, for uh, for a crown prep around gingiva, okay. You don't go. You don't make it flat like that. You have to follow the contour. You have to follow the peak of the bone into the interproximal space. And you can see here. I didn't get it perfect, okay, because it's not at perfectly at bone level. But that's okay, okay. Most importantly is I don't have a. I've got my chamfer. You can see my chamfer here. Okay, and I've, I've kept the space, I kept the space that's required for prosthetics. But that is a key factor. You have to make sure if you don't do that, then you are going to end up cutting off all this, all this, all this bone is going to be cut flat and, and level with your buckle plate. That's not what you want. Yeah. So that's a great question. And, um, and um, also one more thing uh, uh, for forming the, and shaping the provisional restoration, as you mentioned, you start to reduce the, the buccopalatal contour of the restoration from that uh, gingival margin about a millimeter below. Correct. One millimeter below. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So when we, when we start to reduce that contour, how far we should go? Because is there any risk for the tissue to collapse in that space? 
what we generally do is we fill we fill that tissue with the PRF, and uh, sometimes if I, if I if I put material, then I'll put some uh, some either aloe graft or um, either aloe graft or um, um, I use a calcium phosphosilicate nova bone. So that will help to to prevent that collapse. Yeah, exactly. That was my question. So we we can use something uh, fast resorbing to fill that space at least for soft tissue to get into there and make sure that we have enough tissue thickness. Yeah, I wouldn't use a xenograft at all because they're too, they're too non-resorbable. I would use either an allograft if you want something, uh, something a little more solid. Uh, otherwise, you can use a tricalcium phosphate or a, or a calcium phosphosilicate, the Nova bones or, or maybe ethos or something like that if you want to. Yeah, and, and for deciding to put a provisional or not, uh, uh, I mean, if you want to do the socket shield in the posterior area, you prefer to again put the crown or you prefer to go with the customized healing abutment? In the posterior, I don't bother about uh, customized he healing abutments there because we've got such wide, we've got such big spaces and we're so far away from the buckle plate that there's no real issue with, uh, with uh, causing an exposure of the shield when you place the crown. So in the posterior area, I will generally go for just a normal uh, healing abutment. Um, a lot of people prefer to uh, prefer to go for more customized healing abutments and emergence profiles. Um, I don't find it necessary, but if that's what you do, I know uh, Chuck Schwimmer from our group uh, loves doing that kind of thing, and he does amazing work, and um, that's certainly something that 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 can be done. Um, but from my, from my own experience, I, I, I don't personally do that. I only do that in the aesthetic zone. Mm -hmm. And the reason I do that is because I want to make sure that my gingival margin stays absolutely perfect. I need to know that my zenith is going to be right. I need to know that my, my proportions are right, that everything's right and that tissue's stable. I want nothing to collapse. Yeah, I think, I think, I think the aesthetic issues uh, usually force us to put a provisional in the aesthetic zone and i really find that not necessary to go with uh, provisionals in the posterior and we can uh, we can go with no, the, with the more healing abundance right How, i absolutely that was, agree that was yeah yeah go go ahead there's one thing that's absolutely critical when we're working when we are replacing the uh, when we're replacing the um, the provisional with a final crown it is absolutely imperative that some kind of individualized impression post is made. Mm -hmm. And it is also imperative that the technician understands that they also have to have a try-in model of just stone so that they can work on a, they can work on a normal model, but they have to have a stone model to make sure that when they transfer the, uh, when they transfer the, uh, the, um, the, the permanent crown, that they haven't changed the contour one, one, one smidgen, even a little bit, okay? Because if they do, it's going to put pressure on the gingiva. And if you put pressure on the gingiva, the gingiva either is going to move or you're going to expose the, uh, you're going to expose the shield. And it's always something you often hear people say, well, how long should the tissue blanch for? And the answer is it shouldn't blanch ever. <clears throat> you know, if you're working in the aesthetic zone and the tissue blanches, the tissue is going to move. So if you don't want the tissue to move, then don't let it blanch. And by, by using a stone model, you can just confirm that that, that that abutment is going to sit passively in your socket. And it's something that most technicians don't understand and don't use. And I've been burnt quite a few times uh, from that, where, where a dentist has then done an individualized abutment, assumed that the technician has... Uh, conform to the shape that's done when the technicians actually don't even look at it. They don't even understand some, not, not all of them. I have to, that's, that's just a, that's a, a broad statement because a lot do, but there are some techniques. We use, uh, I think it's called a monocle. Of it, and uh, that's how we uh, that's how we uh, do the do the third one. 
and get uh, get and we set in all three SDLs and that way we get the the best result. So that's just a key factor. <clears throat> but that's about it. Yeah, I just uh, I just want to find myself again on the screen. <laughs> Let me yeah. So are we can I I don't have you can can you hear me now? Okay, you're there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have you now. I think I think my internet was a little bit unstable, but but now I have you back. Cool. Yeah. I think I think uh, first of all I wanna I wanna thank you so much because I think in these days it's very valuable for all the audience to have the chance to listen to such an expert like you that I, I've always said that um, there are very people, few people like you in that top level of expertise that share every details that they know for make other people being better. And uh, I really want to thank you for sharing it with us, with me, and thank you for accepting this invitation. I'm pretty sure more than 100% that all the audience will enjoy and have enjoyed your amazing presentations and as always again for all especially my Iranian friends who are interested I'm pretty sure they are after listening to you to partial extraction therapy this is based on Howie's PhD thesis it's including all the steps the complications the managements and beautiful cases for all the pet group also, you can find amazing presentations by Howie at dentalxp.com, one of the best online educational platforms. And also, um, it's really interesting that how we want everyone, everybody to be a good practitioner. So as he said, he generally showed you how you can do partial extraction therapies even with, without any kids with only simple birds, with knowing and having the knowledge. But I really recommend you all to take a look at his well-performed and executed kit because I've used it and every steps that you want to do with the socket shield uh, has its own drill and everything is included in the kit. And I'm pretty sure it took, as he mentioned, more than seven, eight years to come up with this uh, beautiful kit. So for those of you interested, just, just search Howie Glockman and you will get any, everything. Howie, um, I just I think uh, what, what, they can, what, what they can do, Amit, if, if they want to, uh, the Implant and Aesthetic Academy, if I can give a shout out to our own academy in, uh, in South Africa. Um, there's a lot of videos and a lot of uh, content on there. And uh, go like us on Facebook on our Implant Aesthetic Academy. Go to our website, Implant Aesthetic Academy. And also uh, like us on, uh, on uh, Instagram. We've got, I have uh, our own Dr. Howard Gluckman as well as uh, Implant Aesthetic Academy. And uh, we'll be doing a lot of very new online stuff, uh, treatment plan discussions and stuff like that coming up. So come and join the Academy uh, in conjunction with Dental XP and, and all the guys there and uh, um, just join, you know, kind of just sharing our knowledge. And as you say, sharing is the key. We want everybody to be doing the same exact quality of work, giving our patients the best that we can. So thank you for hosting this. Thank you for a pleasure. Um, as I say, you're a dear friend and uh, thank you for everything that you do for us. And uh, um, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much, Howie. Hope to see you very soon after all these uh, quarantine. To the craziness. COVID-19 yeah. and everything. And um, stay safe. Say hi to everybody and your beautiful family. And hope to see you very soon. Thanks, buddy. Thank we'll you see so you much. soon. Take care. Thanks so much. Thank you. Ciao, buddy.